I'm Wendy Mitchell. I live in East Yorkshire and I was diagnosed with dementia eight years ago. I'm George Rook. I live in Shropshire and I was diagnosed with dementia eight years ago. I'm an active member of the DEEP network. DEEP connects over 1,000 people just like me all across the United Kingdom. DEEP helps us to magnify our voices, hopes and intentions. DEEP is hosted by the not-for-profit organisation Innovations in Dementia. Our groups are encouraged and supported to identify and speak out about issues that are important to us. In recent years, people like us with dementia have been more involved in dementia research. We've been offered varying levels of engagement and involvement, but we very rarely set the agenda. Research knowledge, processes and outputs are inaccessible to most of us, and it's academics and funders who choose what topics to research. More and more of us have said that we want to have ownership and control of the research. The Dementia Inquirers programme has tried to make this happen. Through the DEEP network, people with dementia have been supported to identify our own research priorities. We can plan and carry out our own inquiries with any support we need and want. During the four years of this programme, we have learned so much and we have shared a lot of resources openly. For example, the DEEP ethics gold standards which we used in assessing the inquirer's funding applications. These are now being used by universities such as Stirling, and we produced also an accessible research methods pack. We have funded and supported around 25 small projects, all led by people with dementia. These are a few of the topics. What's it like for us to give up driving? Can children learn about dementia through interactive games? How has COVID and the lockdown made us feel? Can people with dementia benefit from technology like Amazon Alexa? How can deep groups and admiral nurses work together? So what do we think the Dementia Inquirers programme has achieved? The Dementia Inquirers programme to me has empowered ourselves. It has given ourselves confidence to move forward. I hope it's changed perceptions about people living with dementia and their involvement in research. A huge impact has been developing relationships with researchers and research communities, actually driving the research, not just being the subject. I think it's achieved so much in changing perspective, busting through uh, mythologies prejudices, uh, assumptions. Not only give us a voice, you, it does give us a voice, but it amplifies that voice. Those voices of people living with dementia through their research can impact all over the world, all over the globe. So do we think that the Dementia Inquirers programme has changed us and or others who have been involved? I think being in part of the project has been empowering. We've grown as individuals and as a group, and it's enabled us to challenge what we don't agree with. It's changed my life. I can still be useful. It's given me the confidence to be here in front of you and talk about it. Because when I was diagnosed, I was scared. It's given me a fire and a passion that I want to move things forward. It's opened my eyes to a whole new world. When I got my diagnosis, I initially was positive. And then I allowed the rest of the world, really, to disable me. But through the support of the pioneers, I learned that I could still really well look at a project or look at a piece of work or listen to somebody's take on a, a project. It's been the thing that has given me my persona back. What do we think is different about research which is led by people with dementia themselves? I believe that it is more authentic, you know, because 
it comes not only from the head, but from the heart as well. People that have not lived with dementia, it's a whole different story. They think they know, but we can provide that knowledge. When we choose a subject to research, it's going to be a subject we care about and that matters to us. We know through our experiences what needs to be done. Research with people with dementia gives it that reality and suddenly brings the research alive. So what do we hope, and hope will happen in the next phase? Well, I hope that researchers will look at the project, look at the book, look at the video, and say, we can involve people with dementia. They can be partners in research, not participants. That we can go to them and say, what do you want research? What is important to you? Although I might not see the benefit of this research that we're doing, my grandchildren will. If funders would insist on people living with dementia being involved from the start on equal footing, then what brilliant research would the outcome be? I think the Dementia Inquirers program has shown that people with dementia can be researchers. And, you know, it's often thought that the two must be streets apart, but they don't have to be. I think it's challenged my prejudices about dementia. It's made me realise that actually living with dementia is something that is going to face a lot of us, and we can do it a lot better. This group has influenced everything from the questions we ask in research through how we ask those questions. What, what, what data we collect, uh, how we consolidate feelings and emotions into knowledge. My message for other academics is really listen and consider where could they fit within your programme. If you're thinking that this is important to people with dementia, why don't you check? Why don't you ask? Academic researchers tend to have a formula about how they generate research questions. People with dementia aren't bound by that. So what they actually ask is the questions that matter to them. I also hope that researchers who look into dementia realize that it's very, very important to hear from people diagnosed with dementia themselves. And indeed, they can play a part in their projects and their teams uh, and should. What I'd love to see is is the whole academic world become much more open and accessible to people living with dementia as members of that research community so that we can all start to generate knowledge together. My message to funders is you should expect involvement of people with dementia in projects to do with dementia. We'd like to thank the National Lottery Community Fund for giving us this amazing and groundbreaking opportunity. We hope we've done them proud. And also the many academics and others who have supported us with huge enthusiasm and a lot of practical guidance. They have helped us to navigate the labyrinthine world of research. Finally, we invite you to help us carry forward the legacy of Dementia Inquirers. Whether you're an academic, a research funder, whether you provide or commission services or sit on an ethics committee, whatever your role, we need you to be our allies and our champions. At last, we are where we want to be, in the driving seat. The premise that we put forward was um, that music is always deemed to be beneficial for people um, and, and the involvement in music is a known fact of the success that helps them. So what we wanted to do is um, develop our own research and development around what it's like to, instead of uh, just be invited along to sing in a choir or, or that sort of thing, 
to actually learn a brand new musical instrument, which and see how that felt, see whether it made us feel better, made us feel worse, and what the process of that was. And so that was that was the idea. The idea was put forward by by Martin, who's who's um, just to my right there on the screen, and uh, and we kicked off. Um, and it was very much led by us, but Jack, uh, Jack Bakley over there, he really supported it. I mean, he he was a diamond. Um, and we ended up with a 42 page report about how how we benefited from, there it is, lovely, how we benefited from it and uh, and how it made us feel. And we've also got a 25, 25 minute video, um, which, which is available as well, which shows the whole process from being brand new raw to lovely soft tender fingers to um, uh, blistered fingers, as it were, and uh, and along the way. And so that that was the idea of it, and it went. We're very proud of it, and um, and I we intend to share that with as many people as we can. Uh, Martin, I'm going to hand over to you because I don't want to talk too much. Oh, cheers, there, Chris. Um, I think the only thing I would like to say is. Um, the first thing is that um, the, the, the process, the process that we went through, um, it was quite hard at times. Um, and this this is written down um, in black and white. Um, but it was also very interesting. Um, we had some um, very good times all the way through the process and very funny times. Hard learning, very sore fingers, but we had a lot of laughs. But the main part about it was the research. And when we went through the research, um, the good part about the research was actually the support that we did get from Jack and um, Abigail um, <clears throat> through our research. But not only did we learn how to play the ukulele, we learned a bit about music, or that those of you us that didn't have a musical background. So we learned a, a, quite a bit about music. Um, and Phil Self, our tutor, um, along with us, we produced this piece of music. Um, and so we produced it. We couldn't get anyone to sing it because um, no one was willing to volunteer to sing. Although I did offer after a couple of gin and tonics. Um, but that didn't come about. So. <clears throat> But apart from that, yeah, it, it, it was really enjoyable. And, and the research itself, there was so much came out of it. And the bottom line was for me is at the end, um, it was a great piece of music that we had created and performed. And we actually achieved our aim. And what we proved um, is that even with the diagnosis of dementia, and I've heard this all week, um killing this stigma about well if you have a diagnosis of dementia you can't do this you can't do that but we actually proved that we can um because four of the members had no background at all about music um and we picked up that ukulele we were taught how to use it we used it we had a keyboard rocking away a cello rocking away chris on his um i better get this right horn <laughs> this is playing his horn um, and we produced a piece of music and so it just goes to show that we can learn new things and we can still carry on um, thank, you, thank you so much thank you um, and Jack did you want to add anything about the process of doing the research together I think firstly Chris and Martin you, you I think you've absolutely nailed the entire process of, of the project and, and the outcomes that, that we gained from it. You know, we not only do we have a, a wonderful music piece, but we have a, a fantastic report with some really solid findings, but also a really good insight into how it is for people living with dementia to lead their own research projects. And I think that's a, a really powerful piece of piece of evidence that, that we now have you know th this is what it's like for people with dementia to 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 lead on these kinds of projects i think personally 
something I took away with, you know, I, I don't live with dementia, but I work every day with people that do. And as much as our trust down here in Ashford, in, in the Garden of England, we try to be as collaborative as we can for people living with dementia. Too, too often, I think people are recipients. You know, they're recipients of our diagnosis, recipients of our care, um, recipients of the therapy I might give to someone. Um, and, and there just aren't enough opportunities for people living with dementia to, to be collaborative, you know, to work alongside me, for me to kind of take on board their ideas and their views of things that are really important to them. Uh, and that's most certainly something I'd like to do way more in the future, be it through loads more dementia inquiries reports or however however it may look in my working role. Uh, another benefit that came out of it was the, the actual Phoenix group, those that took part, felt so much more together afterwards. We, we kind of got to know each other because the way the Phoenix is, is quite formal. Uh, so we were chatting, we were laughing, we were joking, and we really got to know each other and got under the skin of each other, not in an annoying way, but just, and that, that was the, one of the best results that came out of it, I think, was that interaction, smashing yeah. it was. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful extra thing here about. Thank you. Uh, okay, so last but not least, we've got the York Project, and we've got Damien and Eddie here. And if you could just tell us briefly about what you did and, and what you got out of it. Uh, yeah, our project it was in one of the first rounds of, of, of funded projects. So it was a while ago now, Eddie, and it was sort of it was before the um, the pandemic. But um, we we so it, it was a very long process and obviously got halted. But uh, we we managed to get it get it done in the end. And um, it stemmed from a conversation that um, was was often had within Minds and Voices. And I think that, that you know, that the point was made in the chat there that questions arrive, arise from people with dementia getting together themselves. And, you know, in Minds and Voices, we get together and questions arise. And this was one of the questions that we, we had. It was a conversation about being on your own or being with a care partner. Eddie, what did you used to say? About people living well, on their own. I, I used to get so concerned about people living on their own. Um, people have a carer, well, they're all right, but people on their own we were getting concerned about until we found out that quite a few people were on their own. They were quite happy. Nobody moved anything that they didn't know where it is. And so they were quite happy about it. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was, it was a frequent... Uh... The frequent with a banter within our group, really, you'd say, I pity those poor people and my wife, and she's marvellous. And then, um, and then, and obviously, Wendy would say, Well, I'm happy living on my own because no one moves things, as she said. So, we had a group of people, we split and we decided what we'd do. And Eddie, you were an interviewer, weren't you? You interviewed quite a few people, yes, I did. Um, and it was interesting that when you talk to them, they, they weren't sure about whether they would come back, but the next thing we knew. They all came back to our, our minds and voices. And it's people like that that they get diagnosed with dementia and they're just frightened about it. That they don't want to be seen, they don't want to go out. And I've always said, everybody that has dementia should get people that's free, newly diagnosed out and about. Because it's nothing to be ashamed about. I think what was the beauty of it was the simplicity that's been mentioned before. You know, we, we did a literature view because Brian said you got to find out what's on the internet. <laughs> yes, and, yeah. You know, and um, so I went round to Brian's and we, we, we even had to translate these abstracts that were out there, supposed to be a summary of things, because they were full of jargon and academic language. And but once we sort of simplified them, Brian was able to comment on those, and that was a feedback, and and it was a brilliant piece of work that Brian did. You know, Stuart, when we made the questionnaire, he was a stickler for the punctuation, if you remember, Eddie. And, um, oh, yes. Yeah, and he, you know, so he really sort of, the wording and the information sheet was absolutely spot on. And uh, Barbara did a, a group facilitation. She, and we, we had some of mine, to, uh, some of the up and go group for our, our group session on Zoom. And Barbara did a fantastic job on that. And um, so everyone was involved, really. It was just, it was just lovely to see. And um, yeah, so we produced a report with some recommendations about not what's better, living alone or, or, or apart, but what are the particular needs 
So, you know, it's advice you can give to GPs if they're diagnosing someone living on their own, then they need to say, okay, well, let's look out for supporting people with appointments, etc. And if they're diagnosing someone in a partnership, let's look out for the, the arguments at home, whatever. Um, and we've also been able to, I mean, that report's also contributed to the uh, a piece of research that Sheffield Hallam are now carrying out on the, the needs of people living on their own without without informal support, people living on their own without even a, a family member down the road or anything like that. And that's a fascinating piece of research that we've just started, but they've drawn very much on, on the, um, the Minds and Voices report, which was great. I think we'll stop there. Thank you so much, guys, both Damien and Eddie. That's been a brilliant um, summary of what you've done. And I think what comes out from your report and from everybody's is how actually everybody in the groups has been able to be involved um, using their particular skills, their life experiences, the things that they enjoy. And you've all come together as teams um, contributing individually into a wonderful team project. So thank you so much. Looking back on the whole programme that you've both been involved in for four years, I'd love to just very briefly hear you, maybe start with Rosie. Yeah, um, it's, it's great to hear the work that's been going on. And I think the bit that really resonated for me is is that thing of once you start doing this type of research you can't you can't go back you just you see the value of of having user-led involvement having that lived experience and I think something that's very important in my line of work is is making sure things like those cures and clinical trial research things become accessible and become spoken about in a way that people can engage with and I think that's something that you know dementia inquirers have really put put a flag in the sand of saying this is your starting point now now you need to be better you need to keep building on this and I think it's so exciting to see people come together and want to learn about this because actually co-production and this type of work has just snowballed it's it's you know you can see it growing and growing and everything about dementia inquiries is at the core of that it really is what's certainly given me that kind of motivation to do things differently and and to work so closely with you all so I've been incredibly lucky to be an advisor for the um, pioneers. They have made my life so much better. Um, and it's been so great to work with Rachel and Billy. And just to, to see even on this, on this chat, just see people enthusiastic about changing the way we approach things, um, whether that be research or in care, I think it's about being open to change. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Rosie, for sticking with us for, for four years and contributing so wonderfully in so many ways. You've been absolutely great. Thank you, Billy. Thank I really you. appreciate that. I mean, I don't want it to stop. So if anyone wants to just keep keep on going, we'll do that. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> and I'll leave you, Rachel, to have the last word. Ah, amazing. I never get the last word. <laughs> um, I think somebody mentioned COVID. Damien and Eddie, it was your excellence. And I was just thinking that this, um, having run a COVID session this morning, this programme started just before COVID and was really affected by COVID. But actually... We had huge opportunities because of COVID as well. And a lot of groups continued with their projects and provided the foundations for the next couple of cohorts who came along. And we had a special cohort in the middle who actually researched the experiences of people with dementia during COVID. Um, so I think it should be placed in the context of, of some kind of you know massive life-changing event that we all went through. Um, but for me, Dementia Inquirers, um, it's been an inspiration. It's been, um, it's what, watching the growth, I think, of um, this togetherness, you know, as multiplying all of your projects. You know, we've got 25 projects and um, we know that groups have been through similar processes to you. They've identified the research question that they wanted to investigate because it was something important to them, not given to them by academic researchers or other people wanting to dig around and find out um, their perspectives. But these were generated by people with dementia themselves who then learned new skills. You know, we've heard about Brian and his literature review. Um, don't have sunshiners here today, um, but they've done a you know learned a lot about how to analyse quite a big amount of data that they were surprised to get. So lots of new skills along the way, research skills, 
Um, and I guess I'm always struck by asking early groups, do you feel like a researcher? And everybody went, oh, no, 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 I'm not feeling very, you know, I don't even really know what the word research means. And I think what we've managed to create is a, um, a, 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 a network, a Dementia Inquires network of um, more confident people with dementia who've had a lot of fun and enjoyment and done a lot of hard work and are part of this kind of movement towards um, leading research, really being in the driving seat of research, not just on the end of other people's research. And it's been phenomenal to kind of witness and also um I think well do you all feel like researchers Eddie Martin Chris Warren I can't see Warren I reckon Warren feels like a researcher <laughs> and that's been the best outcome and I guess you know just to reiterate what Rose is saying this was an exploratory project so we really hope that we can um take the learning the huge learning that we've had together and um continue to do more with that mm -hmm.